Welcome to this module on triage of the emergent patient. Welcome to the master course on urgent care brought to you by Cruza. Triage, originating from the French word trier, means to sort or the action of sorting according to quality. In veterinary medicine, this is translated to sorting patients according to top priority or from most sick to least sick. Let's start with choice of triage location in the hospital. A triage room or the immediate patient intake area should contain the basic things needed to treat and stabilize a critically ill animal. This includes, but is not limited to, oxygen supplies, materials for intravenous or intraosseous catheterization, a variety of IV fluids to choose from, monitoring equipment for tests like ECG, blood glucose, blood pressure evaluation, and a crash cart. We will further discuss setup and maintenance of a crash cart in the CPR module of this course. Next, let's briefly talk about how your hospital chooses to organize patients during triage. For example, do you have a color code system such as green, yellow, or red, with green representing the most stable and red representing the sickest patients who need to be evaluated immediately? Even in general practice, having an established triage system can be very helpful as you never know when an emergent case is going to walk through your doors. To simplify the triage process, let's break it up into three main steps. One, assessment by a veterinary technician followed by immediate transfer to the treatment floor if the patient needs to be evaluated by a doctor right away. Two, once a patient is brought to the treatment area, it is time for a veterinarian to take a peek using the primary survey and secondary survey techniques. And number three, don't forget about verbal permission or a signed medical consent form from an owner for your very sick patients. This allows the team to execute some initial diagnostics and to start patient stabilization without having to remove the doctor from the treatment floor. In urgent care, patient physical examination is typically broken down into a primary and secondary survey. Primary survey is a rapid assessment of the animal's respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurologic systems. A brief patient medical and surgical history, current patient medications, and immediate nursing concerns can be re relayed to the veterinarian during this part of the examination. This primary survey should take about less than two minutes or right at the two minute mark. The primary survey patient assessment is based on organ evaluation, prioritizing the three most important systems first, cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurologic. So let's start with the cardiovascular system. Makes sense, right? Let's start at the heart. The primary goal in evaluating the cardiovascular system is to identify poor tissue perfusion resulting in decreased tissue oxygen delivery. To do this, we usually start with six perfusion parameters. Number one, mentation, or how responsive a patient is. This is further broken down into BAR, bright, alert, and responsive, QAR, quiet, alert, and responsive, dollar to press, stuporous, and comatose. Then we evaluate number two, the heart rate, or cardiac beats per minute. Normal for small dogs is around 70 to 120 beats per minute, large dogs, 60 to 120 beats per minute, and normal cats is around 140 to 200 beats per minute. Pulse quality or strength of peripheral pulses is number three. We can do this by digitally palpating the femoral or dorsal pedal pulses. Number four, looking at mucous membrane color. It's an assessment of blood flow at the level of the capillary beds and tissues. For example, light pink is normal where dark red or injected mucous membranes can indicate early compensated shock, and pale pink mucous membranes can indicate anemia or poor peripheral perfusion. For number five, we'll look at capillary refill time. This is assessed by putting gentle pressure on the gums for approximately one second with your thumb or index finger, which causes the blood to blanch or move away from the surface of the membrane. 
the time it takes for the blood to reperfuse the membrane is the CRT or capillary refill time. Normal is less than two seconds. And for the sixth perfusion parameter, we think about rectal temperature. I think it's one of the more underrated tools for evaluating peripheral perfusion, but it's a sensitive marker of blood flow at the level of the capillary beds. For example, cats in shock often have a low temperature or hypothermia. Normal temperature is approximately 99 degrees Fahrenheit to 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit in dogs and cats. In addition to evaluating perfusion parameters, we also need to listen to the heart. Cardiac auscultation allows us to look for evidence of blood flow disruptions through the valves of the heart, which manifest as murmurs. Cardiac murmurs are graded on a scale of one to six, with one being barely audible and six being louder than normal heart sounds, as well as even palpable and sometimes even visible through the chest wall. In addition to allowing us to listen for cardiac murmurs, auscultation of the heart also allows us to listen for arrhythmias. Auscultation then combined with peripheral pulse palpation allows us to listen for an arrhythmia and also identify a pulse deficit at the same time, where the heart may be beating, but the blood flow produced from that beat is not adequate enough to produce pulsatile flow to the peripheral vessels. If an arrhythmia is suspected, or in general, if you feel that the heart rate is too low or too fast, it is recommended to get an ECG on these patients right away. Another part of cardiovascular evaluation is blood pressure acquisition with a Doppler blood pressure being the most sensitive and specific in cats and dogs. A Doppler blood pressure measurement of less than 90 millimeters of mercury is considered low and may represent shock. You can also use blood pressure to calculate the shock index. If you take the heart rate divided by the blood pressure, it gives you a shock index number. Greater than one in dogs or 1.6 in cats is consistent with possible shock. Next, let's talk about the respiratory system. The primary goal for respiratory evaluation is to determine the presence or absence of hypoxemia or hypoventilation. Hypoxemia means low levels of circulating blood oxygen. Hypoventilation or inadequate ventilation, meaning the breathing is too shallow or slow to meet body demands, as identified by elevated blood carbon dioxide levels of greater than 50 millimeter of mercury, we call this hypercapnia in the blood. From there, we then evaluate airflow by listening for stertor or strider, which can represent airway obstructions. Stertor means noisy breathing due to turbulent airflow above the larynx. <laughs> Strider, on the other hand, means high-pitched noisy breathing secondary to turbulent airflow at the level of the larynx or below. Next, just like we auscultated the heart, we'll listen to the lungs. In normal, healthy lungs, you can audibly hear air moving in and out of the pulmonary parenchyma without audible crackles or wheezes. Kind of just sounds like a breeze blowing. A change in that normal airflow can be strongly indicative of abnormal lung function. For example, what if you have dull lung sounds where we just aren't hearing the air moving in and out of the lungs at all? This can be indicative of pleural space disease, such as pneumothorax, or air around the lungs in the chest, pleural effusion, or fluid around the lungs in the chest, and lung collapse. Pleural space disease can be further evaluated with the use of the ultrasound probe. What if you hear pulmonary crackles or wheezes? This can indicate pulmonary parenchymal disease like pulmonary edema and bronchopneumonia. Another useful tool during the respiratory assessment is a pulse oximeter, which allows you to evaluate the SpO2 of the blood. Pulse oximeters measure oxygen saturation of pulsing blood through the use of light emitting diodes. These diodes shoot red and infrared light through a vascular bed and determine how much light is absorbed by the vascular bed to then determine the oxygen saturation. An SpO2 of at least 95% is considered normal. However, values less than 95% can correspond to a partial pressure of oxygen, or PaO2, of less than 80 millimeters of mercury and are consistent with hypoxemia. 
If hypoxemia is suspected or confirmed, supplemental oxygen should be provided. Anytime you're concerned about changes in breathing, it's considered appropriate to administer supplemental oxygen if hypo hypoxemia is suspected. All right, so we've talked about the heart and lungs, but now it's time to talk about the last step of our primary survey, looking at the neurologic system. We briefly talked about the importance of mentation assessment when we talked about our perfusion parameters. If a patient is classified as dull, sedate, comatose, or stuporous, a bedside modified Glasgow coma scale should then be documented to help stage the patient's progression with treatment in the hospital. We will discuss that further in the neurologic emergency section of this course. Next, we want to look at brainstem reflexes by quickly evaluating pupil size and position, pupillary light responses, and the absence or presence of physiologic nystagmus. Next, we look at the patient's motor function and look for changes such as ataxia, unsteadiness or a drunken gait, paresis, weakness, paralysis, proprioceptive deficits, and falling, circling, or head turning in one particular direction. We also want to assess for the presence of spinal pain, starting at the level of the cervical spine and moving all the way down to the lumbosacral spine. We don't want to miss any pain anywhere. Immediate intervention is indicated for patients with seizures and severe alterations in mental status, including stupor or coma. Consideration should be given to immediate initial point of care testing, such as electrolytes, blood gas evaluation, blood pressure, blood ammonia, and blood glucose evaluation in patients with severe neurologic deficits. Increased intracranial pressure should be suspected in any patient with a severely altered mental state. Low heart rate and elevated systemic blood pressure are in indicators of cerebral edema or brain swelling. Consider placing these patients on an elevated slant board and lifting the head and neck 15 to 30 degrees to decrease cerebral blood volume through increased venous drainage while you're waiting for additional testing to be performed. Once the primary survey has been completed, a secondary survey can be performed. The secondary survey includes review of patient history, including past medical problems and current medications, as well as a more thorough physical examination, including peripheral lymph node assessment, abdominal palpation to assess for gastrointestinal pain or organ enlargement, further evaluation of the musculoskeletal system to look for fractures, trauma, pain, joint swelling, arthritis, and a rectal examination ruling out loose stool and hematochesia. A urogenital examination includes external evaluation of genitalia and palpation of the bladder to assess for pain or obstruction. Now that we've finished our initial patient assessment, let's touch on some basic point of care diagnostics that are extremely important in the urgent care setting. Point of care diagnostics are our first line test used to effectively determine the cause of clinical signs in an urgent critical patient and generally encompass point of care blood work and focused ultrasound examination. Point of care blood work includes PCV total protein, blood glucose, blood gas analysis, lactate measurement, electrolyte evaluation, and evaluation of creatinine. PCVTP, or packed cell volume and total protein, gives us a correlating number to evaluate the level of circulating red blood cells and proteins in the body. It also helps us to evaluate for the presence of severe anemia or hemorrhage. A blood glucose evaluation lets us look for the presence of hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, which can indicate sepsis, toxin ingestion, insulinoma or insulin overdose, toy breed hypoglycemia, and liver failure. Hyperglycemia or a glucose of greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter can indicate stress secondary to increased counter-regulatory hormones such as cortisol, or it can be indicative of an endocrinopathy such as diabetes mellitus, diabetic ketoacidosis, or hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. An acute increase in blood glucose of greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter can be seen in patients with severe cardiovascular and or respiratory dysfunction and may indicate severe impairment in tissue oxygen delivery and impending cardiopulmonary arrest. Third, we'll look at blood gas analysis. We'll talk about it briefly as it's a big topic. 
But for the point of this module, we'll look at metabolic acidosis, which is a pH of less than 7.34, a base deficit of negative 4 millimoles per liter in dogs, or a base deficit of less than negative 5 millimole per liters in cats. It's often associated with hyperlactatemia or elevated blood lactate in critically ill dogs and cats. However, can also be a marker of diabetic ketoacidosis, renal failure, renal tubular acidosis, and loss of bicarbonate from the gastrointestinal tract. Severe metabolic acidosis at less than 7.2 can cause myocardial depression, blood vessel vasodilation, and subsequent hypotension and decreased response to drugs needed to correct that low blood pressure like epinephrine. It's a life-threatening situation. For metabolic alkalosis, we think of a pH of greater than 7.45. It's most commonly seen in critically ill patients with hypochloremia from gastrointestinal loss associated with severe vomiting, such as what you would see with a gastrointestinal obstruction, GI stasis, or chronic regurgitation. We can also see it in patients with respiratory derangements. Next, we'll talk about lactate, which is a byproduct of carbohydrate metabolism in the body and becomes elevated when there is decreased tissue oxygen delivery. Elevated lactate is a sensitive marker of tissue hypoxia or decreased tissue oxygen delivery in the body. Then we'll look at electrolytes. Acute and severe changes in sodium, potassium, and calcium can be life-threatening, manifesting in cardiovascular and neurologic abnormalities. Creatinine is a byproduct of muscle protein metabolism. Change in creatinine is a sensitive and specific marker for renal function and is important to obtain on most patients presenting through the ER or urgent care. Serial measures of creatinine in conjunction with urine output can help to determine the absence or presence of acute kidney injury. After point of care blood work diagnostics, an additional point of care test that can be used is the ultrasound. If available in your hospital, a point-of-care ultrasound can be extremely useful for diagnosing and treating a patient presenting through the ER or urgent care center. Evaluation of the thorax and abdomen with the ultrasound allows the clinician to look for the presence of free fluid in the abdominal, pleural, and pericardial spaces. It's quick and it's able to be done by the patient's side. If effusion is present, it should be sampled immediately and evaluated for the presence of bacteria, clotting or non-clotting blood, atypical cell populations, bilirubin, urine, or anything else that you feel that you need to look for in this patient. In looking for the presence of bacteria and fluid or septic effusion, like you might see with a perforated bowel, you can compare the lactate and glucose of the effusion with the lactate and glucose in the peripheral blood if you can't see intracellular bacteria immediately on a microscope slide. A lactate difference of greater than two millimoles per liter and glucose difference of, greater, of less than 20 milligrams per deciliter of the effusion compared to the blood may indicate sepsis. Similarly, if you're evaluating for the presence of urine in the peritoneal space, like you might see with a ruptured urinary bladder, you can compare effusion potassium and creatinine to that in the blood. Effusion creatinine to blood ratio of greater than 2 to 1 or effusion potassium to blood ratio of greater than 1.4 is consistent with uroperitoneum. For evaluation of bioperitonitis, biopigments or acellular mucinous material may be seen on a microscope. However, you can also compare bilirubin levels of the effusion to that in the blood. Effusion total bilirubin to blood ratio of greater than two to one is consistent with bioperitonitis. So if you're looking for a ruptured gallbladder, that's your mark. Finally, point of care ultrasound can be used to evaluate the pleural space and heart. Once you have become more proficient with focus ultrasound exams, you can easily rule out pneumothorax, pleural effusion, fluid within the pulmonary parenchyma, and even learn to evaluate LAO ratios to look for changes in heart function. So that's it for the module on triage. Please proceed to the next module in this course. Thanks.